Okay, so I would like to thank the Nobel Committee and the Royal Swedish Academy for bestowing this great honor on my colleague and me. And uh, I will try to describe in this talk, there will be three short parts. One, the overall motivation, a short historical perspective, and then demonstration on enzymes and on more complex systems. So, uh, don't get scared. Uh, in our body, there are cells. Uh, you have hormones and other things that tell the cell what to do. And my main point is that all of these junctions, or most of them, are proteins that you would like to understand or to try to understand how they work. And the good news is that since the late 50s, after Perutz and Kendrew solved the first two proteins, there was huge advance. There are a lot, a lot of structural information. Uh, from my perspective, very important were the solutions of structure of enzymes, lysozyme by DC Phillips, and chymotrypsin by David Blow. And one of the key questions is, how could you use the structure of enzymes to understand how it works? Essentially, the center of at least my interest is how different complex molecules are working. So we have the structure, and for the people who don't know what are enzymes, uh, okay. On my screen, you did not see it, but it chopped molecules much, much faster than the same reaction in solution. And the question has been for a very long time, what is about this biological construct that makes it work so fast? And uh, at some stage, at least I concluded that it is too complicated, despite the enormous information, and knowing the structure, and knowing how fast it works, is not enough. And one way to realize it is that if you have a clock, uh, you could see the clock, you could see how fast it works, and uh, some of us, I mean, there are people like Ehud Barak in Israel who knew to assemble clocks, but most of us don't know how it works. And uh, I would uh, liken the biochemistry is kind of finding the clock. Crystallography shows all the parts. A single molecule spectroscopy show us how fast they rotate, and you still want to understand. So, uh, my introduction to this problem was relatively early. Uh, during my undergraduate work at the Technion, I had a project where I tried to figure out the speed of chymotrypsin by NMR, uh, which essentially I succeeded, uh, but uh, we submitted an abstract. I did not want it to be published. And uh, the conclusion was that enzymes do not work by electrostatic effects, which, of course, is extremely incorrect. But uh, this was the conclusion. You change the salt concentration in solution, nothing happened. Therefore, electrostatic is unlikely to be important. I had another glimpse into enzymes uh, I took physics course with the physicist on, from a very complicated book about collisions. Uh, I did not understand most of it, but what I got from the class was that there are always solutions, most of them due to Max Born, which are asymptotic solution. If you know what happened at the beginning, at the end, you have a good chance to figure out what happened at the complex part. And I told the classmate of mine that one day I will develop a symptotic wave function for enzyme. Uh, I did not know how. 
And uh, when I finish the Technion, I have to choose where to go. And in contrast to Mike Levy, who saw TV programs said uh, choose science, uh, I never really saw too much what to do next. But I read a news article about Schneur Lifson, who became the scientific director of the Weizmann Institute. And uh, my only information going to his group, which was only me, was that his kibbutz near David was three kilometers from my kibbutz. And uh, I thought it would be interesting. So, I, by the way, this is again a true story. So I joined him, and during uh, like 66 to the end of 69, uh, we were involved with developing what became called the consistent force field, and with the great help of Mike, uh, designing a program that allowed to do molecular mechanics, which means to treat large molecules as ball and springs, and to get the actual solutions. So this molecule could describe vibrations, structures of crystals, and so on and uh, Mike used it later to minimize proteins. So this was the first stage, seeing that you could model uh, almost anything by ball and springs. Uh, near the end of this work, I also experimented a little with valence bond, but when I moved with Martin at 1970-72, we developed this uh, QM plus MM for retinal and other conjugated molecules where you model the pi electrons quantum mechanically and the sigma classically. So it's a combining classical force field with quantum descriptions of delocalized electron. Uh, it's still quite powerful approach. And then when I returned to the Weizmann Institute, I decided to go back to try to do enzymes. I wrote a program that nobody except me ever used it, which described all the atoms, quantum mechanically, all the electrons, and then combine it with molecular mechanics a program that Mike was using to model lysozyme. And I basically thought that uh, I will just put the substrate of lysozyme, which is a sugar molecule, inside the enzyme and the bond will break. And uh, after a few months, I found that uh, my enzyme is much slower than any real enzyme. Essentially, no bond is ever being broken. And uh, the story was, after few more months that the major effect of the enzyme was missing in this combination of quantum plus molecular mechanics. Uh, it appears that when you break chemical bonds in solution, it usually breaks to plus and minus. And you need the environment to tell the quantum that it is good to be plus and minus. Uh, all of this is one line in the code, but uh, it was not done before. And with this, uh, there was the emergence of the couple QMMM, which allow you to look at a protein. So in principle, you have small part by some quantum mechanical programs, the rest by molecular mechanics, and you hope that it will let you model proteins. Uh, this is part of the overall approach. I don't know if it's working of focusing on the important part and having the rest with less pixels. And uh, eventually, I found out that uh, it will take 30 or 40 years until the original QMMM will give reliable results with free energy. We could do it only now. And I moved to a valence bond descriptions, similar to what Martin described, but with the environment the solvent influencing the initial and final state. Now, this is exactly the asymptotic wave function I was talking about from 65. And this appeared to be extremely powerful. 
And the main reason why it was so powerful is that you train the enzymatic reaction by studying chemistry in water. So we did not have to invent quantum mechanics for the reaction. We calibrated on chemistry in water, and then we removed the water and put in the actual protein. I'll just show you very few examples. Uh, this is a protein that involves in signal transduction. Uh, when it is defected, you get cancer. Uh, So this is a simulation of a reaction. See. Uh, there is a water molecule attacking phosphate and breaking phosphate-oxygen bond. Hmm, nothing happened as usual. Does it move? Uh, okay, it should move by itself. Anyhow, it eventually breaks. But the point is not to produce such movies, but to actually calculate the energetics of the reaction in different systems. And uh, it works quite accurately. You could predict the effect of mutation. In later years, we specialize more in mutating the protein. This is from Jen Wang, who was both very, or is very good artist and very good scientist. So you basically mutate the protein, and it does give you quantitative results in many, many cases. So you could predict what will happen with mutation that has general applications. Uh, we also use this approach to actually solve the secret of enzyme catalysis. Uh, it's Harder to understand than what most thinks, because actually the enzyme work so fast, not by interacting very strongly with the broken bond, but by not spending energy changing its structure when you move from the reactant to product. So this is called pre-organization effect, and I encourage you to read. We don't have time to discuss it. So now we move to the second part. So we know to do enzymes, we do it, we try to do enzyme design. And now there is other part, how do you treat large systems in long reactions? Now, when you have very fast reactions, it's really easy to use atomistic molecular dynamics and to see what happened. In one example, uh, you solve Newton equation of motions, you saw Martin early trajectories when you applied to the visual pigment, uh, you, you produce a movie. Uh, this is the 76 work, which was done in uh, basically Walt Disney animation. And uh, what happened is that after absorption of light, uh, this one refused to move. Uh, Okay, you will see in a minute. So this is the ground state. A light will come eventually. I know it because I saw the movie. The light will come from here. And the molecule will rotate from cis to trans. And it happens really, really fast uh, when the light comes. It rotates without changing so much the structure. So it's a very restricted motions. Eventually, when it's finished to rotate, it pushes the protein. Protein change structure, activate G protein. So it's like the GPCR, which is last year Nobel Prize. And it's uh, eventually visual signal. We use similar approach for photosynthesis. And now we try to ask what happened when the time is long. You have to do something. Uh, of course, computers become much stronger, but uh, at present there is a lot to be done with simpler models. So the trick is to use what are called coarse grain modeling to simplify the atoms. Uh, the beginning of this was work with Michael where we replace 
the atoms by the side chains by spheres. Uh, in more recent, in more recent years, we felt learning from enzymes that electrostatic is the key to structure function correlation. We trained this initial 75 model to give us reliable energies. And it took telling charges how much it costs to move from water to the protein. It took telling charges how much they like each other. After doing it, and you will see how basically nice energetics it produces, we also have the questions of how do we model reliably motions in very long time, milliseconds, even seconds. So uh, this is regular all atom molecular dynamics. Uh, this is supposed to be fish. Uh, let's do it again. Uh, <laughs> Yes, so uh, when you try to simulate fish, you don't simulate all, everything around it. You simulate it as effective random motion or as a friction. So the trick is to find the right, the correct friction for motion in a protein. And uh, there are ancient theories, Shantashakar, all of them. None of them actually give you the correct friction because there is always issue of memory. So we invent approach which we stole the name renormalization for it. And the idea is as follow. You take a full model. This is the adrenaline kinase you heard in the previous lecture. But we don't want to wait until it will close. So we apply to it very, very strong force and force it to close relatively fast. Then we take a simple model with friction. We apply the same force and adjust the friction until both the full model and the simple model move at the same speed. Once this is done, we remove the force and just let Brownian dynamics work on the simple model where we tend to believe the results. So we could produce, in principle at least, single molecule and NMR results, and we could ask questions. And I will show you now in the next four examples what we could do with such a model. So there is a ATPs. It's kind of the hydrogen atom of motors. And a, one of the nice questions about this guy is that when the central stroke rotate, it turned the, these units and force the reactions of ATP to ADP to occur. Now, here we have plenty of structural information, not of all the intermediates, but basically more than any other system. Beautiful single molecule <coughs> experiment of Kitashita and others, which have very interesting conclusion. Instead of rotating 120 degree in each part of the cycle, it rotate 80 degree and rest, and then the chemistry occur. So the question is, could you use the structure to figure out why it happened? Uh, we use this electrostatically enhanced coarse grain model, and already in the first attempts, first we got this nice direction, the energies are in the right range, and uh, my postdoc, Cheyenne, found that at 80 degree, because of electrostatic effect, it does not want to rotate anymore. And we end up with what look like a complicated diagram. Uh, I remember that Mike once asked me, could you tell me in one minute how ATPs work? Uh, this is the answer, but it's more than one minute. Uh, what happened is that when you try to hydrolyze ATP to ADP in water, 
it would take you months. The barrier is very high and there is nothing useful to do with it. When you put it in the protein, it rotates up to 80 degrees. Then the barrier is reduced drastically and in milliseconds it rotates. Then the phosphate goes out. You go downhill in energy. This is the energy of life. These 10 kilocalories is what drive living processes. And this type of model allow you to ask many questions. Uh, we also ask other questions on proton transfer in the lower part, but we won't talk about it. Now, you heard about this type of, in this case, it's myosin-5. It's walking in one direction. And because our coarse grain model is uh, powerful in producing energetics, we try to ask what to me is the key question. Why it goes in one direction? I know that this one, I will have to go out of this just a second. Okay, so so usually when you walk similar people or the same person forward and backward, they walk in the same speed. So you, can, I mean, no problem. does not happen in daily life. And the question is, why it happened to myosin-5 and essentially to all of these systems? What forced them to go in one direction? And uh, there, is, there are structural models. We put them in our model, and we found that we get electrostatic energy of 11 kcal per mole, which, by the way, agree with force experiment, that when the knee is bent, it's easier than when the knee is straight. And uh, as much as we are concerned in all this complicated cycle, which become much more complicated here, and in the paper it's even more complicated, uh, when you go through it, you find that going backward has much, it's much harder to go backward than forward. And uh, you could ask many questions along this line. So this is an example of using a simplified coarse grain model, focusing on electrostatic. Uh, we could also run Langevin dynamics and ask other questions. And now, how much time I have? Where is the guy? Okay, so now I will just give you two more applications. Uh, uh, we could use the same philosophy to ask many questions. There are voltage-activated ion channels. Uh, this is Rod McKinnon, who got the Nobel Prize for it. And uh, there is this fascinating issue that when the voltage is like this, they are close. Uh, when you change the voltage, maybe let's see it again, uh, it become open. And the question is, could you simulate it? Now, there are simulations with this uh, DE show computer, but it's hard to know what really happened. And the problem is, at least from where I'm coming from, I do not believe continuum electrostatic, so I have to see everything. And we felt that we must model the electrodes, the electrolyte, and all of this. So we done it. And uh, this is an older movie of uh, without the voltage. These guys are the potassium. They are in different colors, so you could follow them. And these are the chlorine. 
so we could model this. And the more exciting thing is that now we could understand the early current in such systems by doing what I think are sufficient simplifications, uh, still keeping the physics. The last things for one second, there is the ribosome, which is very complicated by itself, but to make life much more complicated, uh, Gunnar von Einer, who is here, uh, connected a faulty peptide, which usually stuck in the ribosome, to the translocon, and uh, sometimes the translocon help this guy to be pulled in. And to model this, you have to, uh, people talk on multi-scale, but you also need multi-talent. Uh, not me, but you have to know to the art of doing many things. So here you have to do the chemistry to see why it's stuck, to model pulling and all of this, and it end up with a nice movie of how a faulty nascent peptide uh, tried to move through the ribosome, uh, move to the translocon, and then, okay, eventually, there is very new paper in Nature, essentially, that confirm our idea that here it fold before it goes to the translocon. Okay, I don't know how long we could wait, so let's leave it. And the last things, if you ask on the future, uh, one of the things which at least interests me is the issue of drug resistance, trying to predict what will be the next move of a virus or another pathogen. And just very shortly, the idea is that we could combine our ability to look on drugs which the virus try to evade by mutating and to add to it the fact that the virus does not want to change groups. This is the enzyme of the virus, it's not the virus. Uh, the enzyme of the virus still want to do their work. So you cannot take this group and change it. It will help not to bind the drug, but the virus will die because it cannot do its work. So this restricts drastically the possible mutations and you could try to see what will be the next mutation. Okay, so basically, to summarize, uh, uh, my view of structure function correlation is that it's mostly electrostatic. Uh, oh, so we show you again the bunny. And <laughs> you have to focus on this. And uh, these are. Uh, I cannot acknowledge all. These are people who done large part of the work, and I thank all of them, and I was told that, of course, that I have to thank my wife. <laughs> no, no, she deserves it. And thank you very much. <laughs>